Well, well, uh, is that on? Does it sound like I'm, can you hear a microphone? Push the button, not good idea. Can't, no? No, yes, no, maybe. I'm not sure. There we go, red light? It's on? Okay, does it make any difference? <laughs> no, maybe. <laughs> well, I, I, it's such an honor to be here. Um, all the things that have been said about Margot Wilson, you know, she's, she's just uh, been a leader in every single way uh, in terms of the science, in terms of her uh, development of sort of academic enterprises like the one that's going on at, at McMaster. And um, a pioneer in, in every way, so it's such an honor to be uh, invited to talk in her honor. And I. I'm going to talk about something that has obsessed me for the last little while. But, you know, it was Margot and Martin who really started paying close attention to this uh, discriminative parental solicitude. I kind of wish they'd picked a different label. Not quite so, you know, do we have to have so many syllables. But they started talking about this in the 80s. Now, it was a time when I would not have thought those things were uh, related to any of my research, but what I'm, what I'm going to um, see if I can do in, in the time we have together is link that early work that they did to things that I now think are really cutting edge in, in understanding human evolution. And it, and it really started with the work that, that uh, Margot Wilson is responsible for. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to talk about um, how, first of all, I think actually most of you in this room already know this, that we are uh, hominids and so are all the other great apes. We're all in the same radiation. And it's amazing how closely we're related to all the other great apes, the closest ones in the genus Pan. And in fact, they are closer to us than they are to the other great apes. So we're very like. Uh, chimpanzees and like these other great apes, and yet the gulf between them and us seems so enormous. You know, it seems that we are so different from them. We do all kinds of stuff, well, like this, for example, what we're doing here. Um, but, you know, every uh, ethnography records people playing games and having rituals about things and, and, uh, things that, that we really elaborate in our own culture, medicine, sports, art, science, I mean, actually all kinds of stuff that I see going on in this building. Um, now, you wouldn't think that tackling that question, you'd start with longevity as a thing that really separates us. But the argument I want to put on the table is that really turns out to be a very interesting place to get us back to some of those really fundamental differences. And of course, I'm not the first, me and my collaborators, we're not the first to pick out this thing about longevity as something really unusual about us. So here is the great primatologist Adolf Schultz in, in his book, The Life of Primates, at the end of the 60s. But he'd been doing this work earlier, so I could have picked an earlier time for him saying the same thing. And doing this comparison between what we see with human life histories and what we see with chimpanzees, our closest living relative. And, and one of the big differences is our enormous longevity. Longevity that is, goes beyond the fertile span, something that looks like such a puzzle when you're thinking like an evolutionist. Now, when I talk about longevity, I often talk to people <coughs> who think it's really something recent in human experience. You know, that actually we all know that now our longevity is, if anything, increasing. Our expected lifespans are getting longer. And the tendency is to think that that's something that's really a result of recent changes in public health and medicine and so on. Because we all uh, know, or people who look at these data know, that actually life expectancy at the lengths we now see it in national um, samples is so much greater than it was just a little while ago. And this really cool compilation of open and Vopels more than 10 years ago in science really brings the point home. So they are tracking national census data 
um, from the middle of the 19th century onward and looking at life expectancy in years. And what they show is a thing that would be consistent with the idea that there didn't used to be any old people if you thought life expectancy was a measure of that. Because it's true that if we go back to the middle of the 19th century, life expectancy was way less than 50 years. Well, that fact is eas easily misleads people into thinking it meant there weren't any old people. So this is Sweden. I probably should go back to say this is Sweden, too. So this dot is Sweden. This is a census, uh, a life table built from, from the census for Sweden in 1840. And what I'm showing is just half of the population pyramid. We're just looking at the female side. And each one of these bars is a uh, five-year age class. And the, um, the, the, the width of the bars is the fraction of the population in that, in that age category. And these are the girls. Female fertility just barely begins at 15. The green bars are the females in the childbearing years. And then there are those kind of peach-shaped colored ones up there at the top, women who are past the childbearing years. Now, in this population, life expectancy is only 44 years, but a third of the adult females are past the age of 45. They're past their childbearing years. And if we look at this population, if you were lucky enough to live to 15, your chances of living past those years were superb. Most females did. So this life history picture is really capturing a thing that characterizes humans. This is Sweden. Now that was in the middle of the 19th century. It was an agricultural population and so on. But if we look at hunter-gatherers, and that I have been especially interested in taking the opportunity you know, we have that there are places on the planet where there are people actually living on wild foods. And you know, agriculture is just yesterday, right? 10,000 years ago, nobody was depending on domesticates. And here are three of the best studied hunter-gatherers, quite independent populations. We have to go way back to find uh, a, a common ancestor for these three uh, populations. But we're, all ta we're talking about modern people. Uh, the best studied hunter-gatherers in the world, the Kong, not Nancy Howell's brilliant sort of field-defining work for how you do how you do demography in a population where people don't know their ages, you know, they don't have birth certificates, they can't tell you when they were born. Um, uh, then we have the Aceh, so these are hunter-gatherers in the New World, in, in eastern Paraguay. And then finally the Hadza, who I'm going to especially pay attention to. But, and these cases, the, again, these are just the female side of the story and the, the pyramid built from life tables but showing the same thing again. The width of the bar is the fraction of the population in that five-year age class. And life expectancy in every case is way less than 40. And yet, um, and, the, and these are all, by the way, adjusted to how fast the population is growing, which is a kind of side issue I won't really talk about. But again, about a third of the adult women are past the childbearing years. This is a signature, in a sense, of our species in, in places where overall levels of mortality can really vary widely. There are, in addition to the demography when it comes to trying to characterize us versus the other hominids, a bunch of things we know now that a few decades ago we didn't know. A bunch of things we know about what life is actually like when you're hunting and gathering. And a bunch of things we know about the other hominids. We know something about what life is like because the descriptions that are available now are much richer than they were a few decades ago. And uh, the Hadza work, so uh, the third population I talked about, is the Hadza example. My Key collaborators, Jim O'Connell and Nick Blurton Jones, started working there in the early 80s. And we went into this project, really, all three of us had different kinds of questions in mind. Uh, we were surprised to discover how the old ladies were so critical economically. I mean, we didn't go in even planning to, 
pay special attention to old ladies. It was just that our, our, our data collection protocol made us look at what everybody was doing, paying attention to variation by sex and age. The old ladies were amazingly productive. Little kids were much more active foragers than we went in thinking was characteristic of hunter-gatherer kids because there were reports from elsewhere suggesting that kids really, you know, child labor begins with agriculture and so on. We found these little kids were just amazingly active foragers, but there were some kinds of resources that are really critical if you're living in the kind of environment that the Hadza are that if you're a little kid are just really impossible for you to very effectively procure. Um, and since some of those resources are crucial food staples, these deeply buried tubers, kids can't do it for themselves, so they have to depend on their moms. But what, we, what was right there in front of us, when moms have new babies, they're paying a lot of attention to that one. You know, it's really detracting from the other activities they were carrying out. And when moms have newborns, it turned out that the key to how well those little kids were growing was the work of their grandmothers, how hard they were working. So we had a picture from people living on wild food in an environment like this in which we had the age structure that we talked about and then that pattern of behavior. And if we look at the difference between using Hadza people to represent us, the, a human version of, of coping with the problem of feeding the kids. Compare that to our closest relatives, the chimpanzees, and we look at this age structure difference, links between the age structure and the pattern of actually how the kids are, are, are managing and getting fed, those links almost leapt off the page to us. So here, taking advantage of a synthetic life table that Kim Hill and a bunch of collaborators working on various chimpanzee sites have pulled together. So this is an age structure built from a life table. And the Hadza one we talked about a minute ago. Here's the story for female um, chimpanzees in the wild. Very few managed to actually live past the end of their fertility. Once again, the green bars, those are the years in which females are cycling and fertile. On the other hand, here's the, the human alternative. Most of the girls who live to the childbearing years live past it. And so we have this big fraction of adults who are past those years. And the pattern among chimpanzees is, if you're a chimpanzee kid, when, when you are weaned, you feed yourself, you get your own lunch, and mom moves on and has another baby. In the human case, when you are a little kid, your mom moves on and has another baby, and she's really not focused on you anymore. Grandmother is the, is the key to how well you're gonna do. And in fact, in this slide, that, that, that woman at, in the center of the picture is her daughter has just had a new baby, and so has her daughter's daughter. She's the great-grandmother of that little boy who's depending on her to um, provide most of what he's going to end up eating. And if we look at what's happening with mortality, which the age structure stuff is showing, but really zero in on this, this is the fraction of adults who are surviving into the next age class. Well, there it is. Practically none of these chimpanzee females live past their cycling years. Most of the girls do. Um, a, a, a really different pattern in age-specific mortality. And associated with it, the somatic um, strength and health that allows those allows us, I mean, here I am, a postmenopausal woman, you know, still, uh, et cetera, <laughs> right? Um, so it is the case that we've got much slower aging going on compared to what we see in our closest living relatives. And that was the beginning of the particular grandmother hypothesis that we've found really leads us to ask all kinds of other questions. Focusing on this difference between the independent rearing pattern that characterizes the other apes, that characterizes 
mammals generally, almost all primates, any of them that are very closely related to us, that you know, kids handle their own feeding problems, take care of themselves, they are independent at weaning, and the human pattern in which that is not the case. Moms move on, have new babies sooner, we have shorter birth intervals because there's somebody to help. Mothers are depending on somebody. And, and our hypothesis is it's grandmother, and since it's grandmother, that has had real consequences for what happened in the evolution of our lineage. This grandmother hypothesis that the version that we have found so powerful takes advantage of some life history models that um, Rick Charnoff is responsible for. So Charnoff started working out on, on this life history question kind of at the end of the 80s, and by 91 he had published a model of mammalian life history evolution, and it fits the primates generally. He was trying to account for the kind of variation that you see all the way across the order. You know, there are some primates, although primates in general have slower life histories than the average mammal of the same size. Uh, so primates in general have slow life histories. There's a huge range across the order from the, some of those small primates that have, have relatively short lives all the way up to the great apes that have much uh, greater longevity, much later ages at first birth, and then there's us, we are the real extreme. And in fact, he even used uh, a, a, a data set uh, of, on primate life history variables in his 93 book that included a data point for humans. And he was showing how, how regular the relationship is between average adult lifespan and age at maturity. And that point out there with the, with the red circle around it is humans. Now, when, when Charnoff published that, he didn't even think about the question of, except, wait a minute, a lot of those, most of, those, most of that lifespan for, for humans is post-fertile. Now, how, how would that fit in the model? But it turned out, as we tried to put all these pieces together, it looked like using his model gave us the leverage maybe to explain a whole bunch of stuff about our life histories. He had talked about a couple of things that tend to be invariants, as he called them, uh, across the mammals. And the same thing for the primates. The primates have essentially the same value on these things. And that's the relationship between age at maturity and average adult lifespan. And if we were to plot those variables for the living hominids, including humans, using hunter-gatherers, well, yeah, the values are essentially the same, just as that figure suggests. Another one of his invariants was the relationship between age at maturity and um, baby production, rate of baby production, which captures this birth interval thing. And here is where humans really stick out. We're really weird. We have babies at a much faster rate than it looks like uh, his model would predict. But we also have this post-fertile period in our lifespan. And putting all of that together suggested that if we count, we, it must be the case that that post-fertile lifespan is actually associated with reproducing gene copies. If, if selection has favored it. It really allows this early weaning because mom can move on because granny's there to, uh, to, to, to cover the action on the kids that are still dependent. And of course, if you've got that longer adult lifespan, then selection would favor maturing later. So we saw uh, that, that putting all these things together suggested really this could be the explanation for our otherwise unusual life history that it could account for what happened in our genus. We've actually talked about how the early archaeology starts to fall into place if we, if we consider all those pieces. But the question, of course, that still hangs out there is, maybe I'm going to yeah, grant you that that uh, verbal story yeah, maybe that could work, but could it really do that? Could grandmothering actually take an ape-like life history and turn it into a human-like one. Well, this is where our, we have to depend on math and modeling. I mean, we don't have 
any other kind of time machine. All kinds of stuff about life history is not preserved in the fossil record. Um, and so, with the help of uh, Peter Kim, a mathematical biologist, we built an agent-based model using assumptions that were based on what we know about the other apes and assuming the ancestral condition was like that, relying especially on chimpanzees because the data are better. They're also more closely related to us, but mostly because the data are better. Um, and uh, so if we're talking about a chimpanzee ancestral condition, you know, there are very many old females, right? And remember what the life table looked like. There are very few. And yet, it turned out that running that simulation, although as we first ran it, we didn't include all the stochasticity, uh, so it would run faster, that if we looked at what the uh, equilibrium was for the ape-like uh, trade-offs, without grandmothering, that um, we should see for females the average adult lifespan that would maximize the growth rate is right about there, about 18 years. If we added very weak grandmothering, and this, this model assumed there was, but we made it really hard on the grandmothers, it was still enough to move this um, ape-like equilibrium into a brand new one that was much more human-like. We wanted to, to build, a, build a model that had two sexes in it. And so let's go back one more. Let's see. So this was just looking at the females. But when we add the males, <laughs> she's trying to manage the technology here. We add the males. And um, initially, it was so, I was surprised at this. So we, we, all, we did have a trade-off for males, just as there's a trade-off for females. The longer lives mean your first birth is later, the kids are dependent longer. Um, uh, we added a trade-off for males, which is you are, the longer lived you are, the less effective you are as a competitor for paternities at younger ages. And when we considered what the trade-offs are for males, it turned out that with, with the two-sex model, the males actually pushed the equilibrium in both cases to be older. And now we have a stochastic simulation, which is, this paper is, is um, still in review, uh, and there, there is a lot to say about this, but what the main, the take-home lesson from this, I would say, is that we add the stochasticity, it slows everything down about, tenfold, actually. But what it shows, and it even shows that because all of this is probabilistic, you know, you might not get the right mutation, all those things could happen, that you might not escape the ancestral condition. But once you do, there are only two equilibria. And one, well, the ape-like one, which you could stay stuck in, or the human-like one. And we start to get time scales that are much more likely to link this pattern to the evolution of our, the genus we belong to, the, the, the story that this is what genus Homo is about. If any of that is on the right track, and even if it isn't, there is this other question that's posed. So the way all of that modeling is uh, aimed is to ask the question, could there really be a fitness advantage? You know, could selection really favor variants that have these consequences? But another question is, how do we do it? I mean, how is it the case that here I am at my advanced age, still more or less walking and chewing gum at the same time? How is it that if I were a chimpanzee, I would have been dead decades ago? And many of you in this room would not be here if you were chimpanzees, right? Um, so, how, well, many of you would, many of you are certainly young enough, but we've got this pat pattern in chimpanzees, um, ooh, I keep going in the wrong direction, we got this pattern in chimpanzees where females are, you know, they're really old and frail and uh, they have difficulty climbing trees in the wild and it's, even in captivity, it's very hard to keep them alive, they're really old. Whereas in humans, 
not the case. Women remain really strong, healthy, productive through the childbearing years and, and decades beyond. And, and the, the riddle about what's going on here is if we really want to understand this difference. So now I've got both the girls over here and the boys in this story, but comparing the age structure of chimpanzees to humans. Now, there's all kinds of questions about how aging works that we have to go to other kinds of model organisms to, to uh, investigate. And, um, you know, since this building is full of people working on all other kinds of organisms that we learn all kinds of important stuff from, I, I firmly agree there are lots of model organisms that are crucial for, or don't even think about them as model organisms, other places in the living world where we can see how selection has shaped living things. But if we want to understand this aging physiology question and we want to understand what makes it that human age structures look like this, where our closest living relative looks like this, then surely what we need to do is compare chimpanzees and humans. Maybe compare all the great apes to humans. If we want to understand what happened in our evolution, those comparisons are crucial. And starting with female fertility, because you know this is this is a standout deal. Now those are girls again, so I'm just these are chimpanzees on the left and humans on the right in this really different age structure. But female fertility ending at essentially the same age in both species. Now, we know a lot more about the human case than we do the chimpanzee case. We know uh, reproductive physiology for mammals generally is very weird. Um, and for all mammals, including us, the, the full complement of oocytes is there right around birth or before, and after that you just lose them. So this is completely unlike male reproductive physiology, right? So females have, at, at about the uh, age of five months past conception, the number of oocytes they'll ever have, and then it's just downhill from there, and birth is not yet to happen. So by the age of birth, women have the number of potential gametes, that's what? If men produce a quarter of a billion sperm in the average ejaculate, you know, we are talking about a, a quarter of a million or less total, and they're all just going to go away after that. And we know more about the human case than we do about the, um, about the chimpanzee case, but the, the similarities that we can talk about suggest that in both of us, it's just a tiny fraction that ever ovulate. They're just going away all the time, mostly through cell death. And in fact, if we look at sections of ovaries, those are chimpanzee ones at the top and human ones at the bottom with age, almost age-matched comparisons. And the ovaries really look the same. And the end of follicular activity associated with cycling is the, the time when the production of estrogen by your ovaries gets to be essentially undetectable. There isn't any more of it. And yet, all kinds of evidence shows that we need estrogen to do a lot more stuff than just run the fertility system. It's really crucial for the maintenance of a whole bunch of other tissues. Now this, uh, for males, they are continually producing um, testosterone, gonadally, and that testosterone can be converted to estrogen in peripheral tissue. So the, the problem for males is different, which is why focusing on females is so interesting. And a nominee for what we might want to pay special attention to is the adrenals and adrenal androgen, which might be crucial here. This is another place where paying attention to non-primates, like rodents, <coughs> who are so useful for a lot of questions, isn't going to help us because rodents produce very low levels of these adrenal androgens. They're much higher in primates. And, and in humans, DHEAS is the, 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 the hormone we all have in highest concentration. Now, this 
DHEA that's produced by the adrenals is then in peripheral <coughs> tissues converted to estrogen. And as Fernand Labrie, who's a Canadian, maybe you guys know him, he's a Canadian, <laughs> Canadian endocrinologist, um, has, has focused on this particular androgen. And uh, as he points out, three to four orders of magnitude higher in uh, its uh, circulating levels than estrogens. And in fact, that three quarters of the estrogens before menopause in peripheral tissues that are doing this maintenance business come from the adrenals and of course 100 percent after and so that means maybe this is a clue or it might be part of how we do it is this part of how we do it primatologists have suggested the rate of decline in circulating levels of this adrenal androgen might be a good biomarker of aging across the primates. They used humans in the, in the sample when they made this argument, some data from RISO, some baboon data that suggested that might be going on. So here are uh, the pulling together published data on women from, from lots of different sources. This is the picture of circulating levels of DHEAS associated with age in women. And if we follow that hypothesis, about the biomarker of aging, then as, as these same people have said, if it is a biomarker of aging, then it ought to change uh, twice as fast in chimpanzees as in humans because the adult lifespan difference is about that. So does that mean maybe it looks like this? And if so, and if it's doing all those things, then that could help explain why chimpanzee females are geriatric in these years, and females are not. Well, to find out, we need some comparative data, and it turns out that's not the picture at all. So these are data from captive chimpanzees, but instead of that pattern of the decline being twice as fast, the decline is actually slower. But the overall story is that the maximum is about a third as high in chimpanzees as in humans. And if we look at the other hominids, their rates are even lower than chimpanzees. So this looks like a really promising line of investigation, which will require us paying attention to the other hominids, uh, uh, to part of the story of how we maintain these tissues um, in our, in our post-fertile life stage, there's another possibility, which is telomere lengths. You know, it, we all have been reading a lot about telomeres and know something about how these are the, the, the repeats at the ends of chromosomes that make um, uh, cell replication work. And those telomeres shorten with every cell replication. And we know that shortening rates are correlated with aging rates in a bunch of taxa. And we know that shorter telomeres for age are associated in, in humans with a bunch of geriatric morbidities. So, so maybe telomeres are, are part of the story. Well, we, if we use the same kind of argument about these comparisons, should we expect them to shorten twice as fast in chimpanzees? Well, again, to find out. We need to look. And it turns out, nah, no, that we might initially, a few years ago, this is what I expected, that the decline would be twice as fast in chimpanzees. But instead, those are the chimpanzee data. These are age-matched human controls, exactly the same protocol. And the um, rates of decline are, are the confidence intervals overlap. They're really not different. but chimpanzee telomeres are twice as long as human telomeres. Well, now we've got some phylogenetic data that put that in perspective. Rodents have very long telomeres. It turns out there's a, a, a negative relationship between lifespan and telomere length across the mammals. Gomes and colleagues used about 60 mammalian species to look at this kind of regularity. And the, the implication yet to be followed up, I mean, this paper is still in review, 
and, and then that requires a lot of subsequent work, but that the increasing longevity in our lineage made cancer danger much more serious, making it advantageous to take, to use cellular aging and shorten telomeres even further with lots of implications for other ways of managing short telomeres that, that are yet to be followed up. So all kinds of things that we want to know if we're going to explain this that will take us really to looking at differences among the hominids. Um, that, that of course we learn all kinds of stuff from comparative genomics and especially what we can use a lot of model organisms for. But again, to understand this difference, it's these comparisons that, that will are right up there likely helping us. And this focus on the difference between what it's like to be an independent rearer and what it's like to, be, to, to, to have mothers that depend on help focuses attention on another thing that's really different about us. We now know, because people have looked at things like grandmother effects and who the helpers are in all kinds of cultural settings, and I've you know, privileged the Hadza because that's, that's really where a lot of these ideas started. But people report over and over again that wherever you look, it is a thing about human mothers. They have help. Somebody is helping out. And it's crucial to the way our life history works that that's the case. Um, and that has consequences. So here is an Ache woman. That baby is going to be born within eight hours of the time the photograph is taken. Her little daughter, who is not yet three, is going to be displaced. All over the place in human populations, mothers move on and have that next baby before the previous one is independent. And that has implications for this discriminative parental solicitude, for discriminative maternal solicitude, for the things that Margot and Martin were talking about decades ago. Now, rather than it being the case that you've only got one, there is more than one uh, kid who is still dependent. And that means that mothers have new kinds of trade-offs in our lineage that our closest living relatives don't have. Uh, Sarah Hurdy talked about this in great detail in, in Mother Nature, characterizing this as ambivalent mothering. You really have to, is this new one a good idea right now? And et cetera. So those of you that haven't read her 99 book, I couldn't recommend anything more highly, although her 2009 book, you should follow right up. <laughs> read that one next. But look at these guys. In other apes, you're the new baby, and your mother is your universe. She has nothing but you to be concerned about. Well, of course, she has to make a living and worry about you know, contesting with other females and what the males are doing. And so it's, she, she's definitely a working mom. But this is the thing. This new one has her full attention because the previous kids are independent. She doesn't have to worry about them. She really. It, it's not an issue for her anymore. And that has consequences for selection on infants. So I never thought I would find that really trying to understand what, what these really young infants are up to, I never thought that would seem to me so crucial if we're trying to explain our own evolution. And now an array of, of uh, developments really pushed me in this direction. And uh, Hurdy has been a real leader in pushing in this direction. But once it's the case that this newborn isn't necessarily the apple of your eye, there is selection on this newborn for which it's a matter of life and death to be sure it's the apple of somebody's eye, you know, ideally yours. So that now there's active selection on the sociality of babies in a way that's entirely absent in the other apes. And Michael Tomasello has talked about this thing that really distinguishes us from the other uh, hominids. I mean, you know, he's especially been interested in chimpanzee-human comparisons. And this thing that he calls shared intentionality. 
this thing about us that we really want to get into each other's heads and that it's something we work at all the time. You know, even here we are, I'm trying to get you to see what I'm talking about. We are, you know, we could never get another bunch of primates to sit here in a room and do stuff like this, you know? <laughs> it's just not going to happen. And yet, for us, just the fact that somebody else is paying attention to it means, wow, what are they paying attention to? All kinds of venues for potential common attention emerge as a consequence of this difference. And maybe that's why there are so many pages to be on. You know, it's really an avenue to enormous variation in what's going on over here isn't quite the same as what's going on over there. We're all, I want to know what you're doing. You want, I want you to know what I want you to know. And you want me to know what I want to know. And all of these things that push us into um, this wide diversity of ways in which we live our cultural lives. Um, if it's the case that, uh, that the, this age structure story is the legacy of ancestral grandmothers, which I, I think is a hypothesis very much worth continuing to pursue. Then it draws attention to distinctive features about our aging physiology that we maybe wouldn't have focused on. And really looking at these comparisons uh, with the other hominids gets to be tricky. And it really draws attention to this real difference in mothering and consequences for the fact that, that mothers have trade-offs, human mothers have trade-offs that, that other primate mothers don't, that other ape mothers don't. And that poses these really unprecedented challenges to infants, which really alters the selection pressure on them. At that as a source of the evolution of our weird psychology, our kind of prosociality. I would say that the best hypothesis we have on the table for where that comes from is Sarah Hurdy's, that it is a consequence of our pattern of mothering. And it has real important consequences for male competition. Now, I, that figure I showed before, you know, we're looking at the female side of the chimpanzee age structure. The, the female side of the human age structure, here is this argument about grandmothering, although the boys are in there. This is a two-sex model. And note that it was really interesting to discover that actually grandmothering makes increased longevity advantageous for males. Even greater longevity is advantageous for males than females. And then I've really emphasized this thing about babies and how that really alters the selection pressure on babies, and then, you know, babies grow up, and here we are. Um, but you might say, and this, by the way, is a, is a, is a Hadza grandmother. This is her granddaughter. This is the, 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 the granddaughter's mother. This is the relatively new baby. These are the people that I've been focusing attention on. And you might say, haven't you left somebody out of the story? <laughs> What about dad? What about what, uh, what, what, uh, what males are doing? And I'm sure most of you know that preferred stories about what happened in our evolution really emphasize hunting and pair bonding and male provisioning. And that, that's not the hypothesis that I've, that I've been talking about. But it's not that I don't, and don't think about what males do. I mean, Male strategies have fascinated me forever, and I just want to underline that, and I continue to work on the question, right? Um, here are these Hadza guys. So this is the same population where the old ladies were doing so much. These guys are, it's not that they are sitting on their duffs. They are spending the days out hunting. They specialize in hunting these big animals, uh, and it's a big deal when they're successful. But it's a very risky thing to do. Most of the time, you come home with nothing. It's a terrible way to plan to feed the kids. 
And yet, this is what, what men spend their time doing. Well, this appetite for joint attention thing really alters all the ways in which people can try to be on the same page. It really alters some things about the form that male competition can take, the ways in which males can continue to compete with each other. The U.S. Senate, I, shouldn't, I should have the House of Representatives in here on a day like today, right? There is all kinds of nonsense going on there that has enormous consequences for everybody. It's hardly trivial. It really shapes, and in the case of the Hadza, what men do has huge consequences for everybody. But look at this. You know, if we, if we talk about the Senate, now these are kind of old data, but I don't think they've changed very much. The median age at which a man gets elected to the Senate, I'm sorry, a person gets elected. You know, we do have a, how many female senators do we have? It's such a small number, I forget. Anyway, 51. Um, and uh, all of those individuals in the Senate, the average age is 62, or was in 2007. And the average tenure is almost 15 years for a senator. Look at the story for chimpanzee males. But, uh, somebody gets to be the alpha in the local group. The average age at which somebody manages it is 20 years. Uh, the average age he gets deposed is 26. You know, he's an old guy by then. The average tenure as an alpha is only four years. Now, you know, samples will increase, et cetera, but it's not going to change that story very much. The age structure is different. It's really changed in important ways. And it means that there are more competitors when a young guy comes in, he's got all those old guys to worry about, which is, although it's not that young chimpanzees don't have to worry about the old guys, they can stop worrying about them when they get into their middle 20s. For a human, there are all those really old guys, and they've established their social relationships way ahead of the young guys coming in. The competitive landscape is so altered by that age structure and by the fact that there can be so many diverse arenas of competition that are associated with this thing about joint attention, which is we are just interested in it for its jointness. It can be about, you know, betting on whether the bird is going to fly or stay there, right? Almost the most trivial things people can compete about. But look what's what this age structure means about the operational sex ratio. Fertility ends at the same age in both species. Uh, by the time you get to 45, practically everybody's dead if you're a chimpanzee. But if you are a human male, you've got all those other guys in addition to the young guys to compete with. So if we talk about operational sex ratio and talk about the number of males relative to the number of females who are ready for a conception, the operational sex ratio is almost twice as high in humans as it is in our closest living relatives, really altering the competitive landscape for males. So what do you think?